there. I'm Spot. You know, Digby the gardener's dog. Everybody on Magic Mountain knows me. Now, some people say I'm a bit naughty, but I'm not really. I just like teasing. Right now, I'm hiding from Morris and Doris. Spot! 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 Where are you? Come here, you bad dog! <laughs> See what I mean? Bad dog, they call me. Well, they won't find me. At least not until I've told you my latest story. Want to hear it? It's called Spot Meets the Tumble Downies. One day, I was at the very far end of the Magic Garden looking for my friend Margot the Mouse. Suddenly, I heard Digby's robot motor. Bleep, bloop, blip, blop, blip, it went. And Digby came rushing down the garden path. Quick, he shouted. We're being invaded by people from outer space. Find Leroy the Lion and follow me. Well, I happened to know that Leroy was far away on the other side of Magic Mountain looking for a place called Tumble Down Town. But I jumped out of the flower bed and ran after Digby. Digby was looking over a hedge just beside the garden shed. Look, Spot, he said. There are spacemen in the kitchen garden. Just when I wanted to get it tidied up in time for the magic garden party tonight. You what? I said. I jumped onto Digby's shoulder and looked over the edge. There were one, two, three... Well, ever so many little people with green faces and blue hair running about the kitchen garden. They were pulling up all the vegetables. Well, making a mess in the kitchen garden is my job. So I jumped over the edge and chased the little people off the vegetables. Hey, you lot, I shouted. What's going on? Where the tumble down is, said one of the little chaps, his blue hair standing on end. You what? Tumble down is, I said. I thought you were spacemen. No, no, we're from Tumble Down Town on the other side of Magic Mountain, said the Tumble Downy. We're having a party today and we're looking for something special to eat. Well, don't take my vegetables, said Digby, looking over the edge. I need them for our party. Well, why don't we all have one big party together, said the Tumble Downy. Great, I said. All right then, said Digby, but don't make too much mess. Just then, there was a zooming sound in the sky. We looked up and there was a little aeroplane with Leroy sitting in it. The plane landed on the garden path. Hello, everybody, boomed Leroy. Meet my new friend, Polly the Plane. I went all the way to tumble down town and the only person there was Polly. Yes, said the little plane. All my tumble downies have disappeared. We're here, shouted the Tumble Downies, and we're going to have our party with Digby and Spot and everyone on this side of Magic Mountain. Oh, jolly good, said Polly, and when the party's over, I'll fly you all back home to Tumble Down Town. So, we all set to work to get the Magic Garden ready in time for the Magic Garden party. And for once, even I was tidy. Spot, Digby says you've made some new friends. Will you tell us who they are? I'll do better than that. I'll get them to sing for you. Ooh. Come along, tumble downies. Line up here and sing your song for Morris and Doris. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Green is the look of our faces. Blue is the hue of our hair. You'll find us in all sorts of places. From Magic Mountain to who knows where. Tumble down is, tumble down is, Magic Mountain pixies. Tumble down is, tumble down is, we like playing tricks. Polly the plane always flies us Wherever we travel or roam The places she takes us surprise us But we know that there's no place like home Tumble down is, tumble down is Magic mountain fixes Tumble down is, tumble down is We like playing tricks Tumble down is, tumble down is, magic mountain pixies. 
Tumble downies, tumble downies, we like playing tricksies. Hooray! <laughs> now, let's settle down and listen to the story. I know what it is. You are? How do you know, Morris? Because I peeped into Carol's storybook. It's called Sleeping Beauty. Once, long ago, there lived a king and queen who had a baby daughter. Because they had waited so long for her, the king and queen thought that the new princess must be very special. We shall invite all the fairies in the land to our baby's christening, said the king. We'll send out twelve invitations straight away. But alas, they forgot to invite the thirteenth fairy. On the day of the christening, all the fairies stepped forward to give the child their gifts. She shall be both good and kind, said the first fairy. She shall be as beautiful as the spring, said the second fairy. She shall marry a handsome prince, said the third. Soon, eleven fairies had given the child their presents, and the little princess now had enough good wishes to make her life happy forever. Suddenly, the door burst open and the thirteenth fairy stood in the doorway. You may have forgotten me, but I have not forgotten you, she shrieked. When the princess is sixteen, she will prick herself on the sharp spindle of a spinning wheel and die. Then the thirteenth fairy lifted her wings and flew out of the great hall. The queen began to cry bitterly, but the twelfth fairy stepped up to her and said, I have not yet given the princess my gift. I cannot undo the wicked spell, but I can change it. When the princess pricks her finger, she shall not die. Instead, she will sleep for a hundred years. The king thanked the kind fairy and ordered that all the spinning wheels in the kingdom should be chopped up for firewood. In this way, perhaps the spell will not come true, he said. Sixteen years passed. The princess grew into a beautiful girl whom everyone loved, just as the fairies had said. One day, she decided to explore a high tower in a corner of the palace that she had never been to before. She climbed a winding staircase to a room where she found an old woman sitting at a spinning wheel. Hello, said the friendly princess. What are you doing? Of course, she had never seen anyone spin before. Why, spinning at my wheel. Come and try it yourself, my dear said the old woman. But as the princess took hold of the spindle, she pricked her finger and <gasps> fell down in a deep, deep sleep. That will teach people to forget me, cackled the old woman, who was really the wicked fairy. The spell had come true. <laughs> At that moment, the whole palace fell asleep as well. The king and queen in their office where they had been working, the cook in the kitchen as she stirred the gravy, the maid doing the washing up, and the kitchen boy with his finger in the jam. The whole palace was quiet. A great many years passed, and a tall bramble hedge grew up around the palace so that only the tower where the princess slept could be seen. The story of the sleeping princess spread through the land. People called her Sleeping Beauty. One day, a handsome prince came riding by. That must be the palace where the beautiful princess sleeps, he said to his page. I'm going to see if I can get in. As he took out his sword to cut down the brambles, 
a very strange thing happened. The brambles turned into beautiful roses that bent to make way for him. He walked through the palace, staring in wonder at the sleeping people and animals. At last, he found the staircase to the tiny room where the princess slept. The prince pushed open the door, and there lay Sleeping Beauty. How lovely she is, said the prince, and bent to kiss her. At that very moment, all the years the princess had slept passed as if they were minutes. The princess opened her eyes. Who are you? What has happened? she asked. As the prince explained what had happened, the whole palace began to wake. Oh, bless my soul, my dear, said the king to the queen. I believe I dropped off for 40 winks. Mm, I think I've had a little snooze too, said the queen. Oh, just look at all these cobwebs. In the kitchen, the cook finished making the gravy, the kitchen boy sucked the jam from his finger, and the maid carried on with the washing up. Soon the whole palace had come to life. The prince and princess went downstairs to see the king and queen. We should like to be married, father, said the princess. The king was delighted, and soon everyone was bustling about preparing a great banquet as if only a hundred seconds had passed, instead of a hundred years. Maurice! Maurice, help! What's the matter, Doris? No. get our whiskers in a twist, Floris. Uh, come and stand on this chair with me and we can sing to keep our spirits up. Hickory dickory dock The mouse ran up the clock The clock struck one The mouse ran down Hickory dickory dock Where's that mouse gone now, I wonder? Oh, there he is! Hickory dickory dock the mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck one, the mouse ran down. Hickory dickory dock. Hickory dickory dock. Doris, the clock in the hall's chiming. What time is it? Four. Four o'clock. Oh, doesn't our clock sound lovely, Morris? Just like the bells. What bells? The church bells in the song. What song? Oh, don't be so dim, Morris. Oranges and lemons, of course. Oranges and lemons aren't bells. No, but they sound like bells. Sing the song and you'll see. <laughs> Orange 
oranges and lemons Say the bells of St. Clement's You owe me five farthings Say the bells of St. Martin's When will you pay me Say the bells of Old Bailey When I grow rich Say the bells of Shoreditch When will that be Say the bells of Stepney I'm sure I don't know Says the great bell of bow. Here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. Oh, Maurice, that great big mouse has come back again. Huh. Mice aren't anything to be afraid of. Well, you were frightened last time. Me? Frightened of a mouse? Never. Yes, you were. No, I wasn't. Hey, you two. If you got a clock with a cuckoo, he'd tell you when the mice were coming. Oh, look. It's Stephen. I know a story about a cuckoo who lived in a clock. Well, you better tell it quickly before Doris faints. <laughs> it's called the Spring Cuckoo. On the wall of an old house hung a cuckoo clock. Tick-tock, tick-tock went the clock. And every hour a tiny wooden door flew open and out popped a wooden bird. Cuckoo, said the little bird at one o'clock. And cuckoo, cuckoo, said the little bird at two o'clock. There were carved trees and birds and squirrels on the clock. But the little cuckoo had never seen real trees and birds and squirrels. Most of his life was spent in a dark hole behind the clock, fastened to a piece of wire. One winter, a spotted beetle crawled into the hole behind the clock. "'May I stay here and sleep a little?' asked the beetle. "'I will try not to disturb you. In the spring I will fly away again.' "'What is spring?' asked the cuckoo. Spring, said the spotted beetle, is bright blue sky and puffy white clouds and warm winds. It is yellow primroses and the song of the blackbird. It is a dizzy, busy, up and away time. And she went to sleep and snored. Throughout the winter months, when snow was high outside the window of the house, the cuckoo dreamed of spring. Each time he came through the door of the clock, he could just see a patch of sky through the window. One morning, he noticed a change in the colour of the sky. Then he smelled the perfume of flowers. At last he heard a sound like the rippling of water over pebbles. That is the song of the blackbird, yawned the spotted beetle, stretching her legs. I'm beginning to feel dizzy and busy. It is time for me to go. She stretched her wings and flew up, up and away out of the window. The cuckoo, too, felt dizzy and busy. He, too, stretched his wooden wings. And when the door of the clock opened for his eighth cuckoo, he sprang with a ringing noise right off the wire. He flew up up and away out of the window and landed gently on the branch of a tree. How fresh and green the tree was. The little cuckoo took a deep breath of morning air and looked about him. The air was filled with the sound of birds. The blackbird trilled on the branches above him and the blue tit went cheep cheep in the garden below. From the chimney of the house came the coo coo of one dove to another. I wish I could sing too, thought the little cuckoo, but it isn't time yet. He sighed. Just then, some children ran into the garden laughing and stared up at the branches of the tree. Look up there, cried one. A cuckoo! It must be springtime at last. Springtime, whispered the cuckoo. It's springtime! He stretched his wings and flicked his tail. Cuckoo! He sang joyfully. Cuckoo! I can taste the air, I can feel the sun, I can hear the laughter of children. I don't care about the minutes, I don't care about the hours. I will sing for the springtime. And after that, he always did.
Doris, why is our clock ticking so loudly? It's telling us it's rhyme time. Rhyme time! Hooray! Tick, tock. Tick, tock, tick, tock. Make yourself into a clock. Find your left arm, find your right. Tell the time, both day and night. Left arm high above your head, right arm pointing to the wall. Tick tock, nine o'clock, time for breakfast, one and all. Right arm high above your head, left arm close beside it pressed. Tick tock, twelve o'clock, nearly lunchtime, look your best. right arm where it is. Move your left just halfway down. Tick tock. Three o'clock. Playtime, rest time, visit town. One arm down towards your shoes. One arm up towards the sky. Tick tock. Six o'clock. Tea or supper time comes by. Right arm pointing to the wall. Left arm high above your head. Nine o'clock is here again. Long past time for being in bed. Tick tock, tick tock. Look at me, I'm a cuckoo clock. You're cuckoo all right, Morris. <laughs> Hello, Spot. What's the matter? Well, I'm shy. Ah, oh, well, whisper then. What? <coughs> Nobody takes any notice of dogs on Magic Mountain. Of course they do, Spot. Listen to Nigel's story. It's all about a dog, isn't it, Nigel? Yes. It's called The Dog That Rattled. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a boy whose name was Simon, who had a puppy called Smiler. When Simon first saw Smiler, he was very happy and gave him a hug. But when he picked up Smiler, Smiler rattled inside. So Simon shook him and he rattled again. He put him on the floor and Smiler jumped up barking. And every time he barked, he rattled. Simon's mother heard him and came in. She couldn't understand it. She picked Smiler up and again Smiler rattled. He didn't seem to mind much and kept wagging his tail. Still, it can't be right, said Simon. Can it, Mummy? No, she said. Let's take him to the vet. So they went to the vet. The vet shone a light down Smiler's throat. Say 99, he said. <coughs> barked Smiler. Hmm, nothing there, said the vet. I can't understand it. Take him home and give him some dinner. And if he isn't better tomorrow, bring him back again. So Simon took Smiler home and gave him some dinner of steak and dog biscuits. Smiler ate it all. <coughs> Now, come and sit on my knee and go to sleep, said Simon. He picked up Smiler. And this time, Smiler didn't rattle. Well, that's fine, thought Simon. He's better. He stroked him for a bit and then put him down to sleep in his basket. When Simon got up next morning, the first thing he did was to go and see if Smiler was all right. Smiler wagged his tail and jumped up, and right away, he rattled as badly as ever. Oh, poor Smiler, said Simon. Never mind. He gave him some breakfast, and they set off again for the vet. After they'd gone a little way, Simon noticed that Smiler wasn't rattling. Oh, that's funny, he thought. He rattled before breakfast. Well... It's no good going to the vet if he's better. So he went on the common, and they had a lovely time playing until they were both tired and set off home. <coughs> on the way home, 
Smiler started to rattle again and it got worse and worse until he was rattling so loudly that all the people and the cats and the dogs and the birds were following to see what was making such a noise. Well, they got home and Simon gave Smiler his dinner. <coughs> After dinner, Smiler jumped up on Simon's knee and he didn't rattle anymore. He didn't rattle all the afternoon. So that was it. He just rattled when he was hungry. He couldn't help it. He was that sort of dog. Smiler wagged his tail. And as it was tea time, he rattled. So Simon's mother put the kettle on and they all had tea. Doris, can I have a cup of tea? Certainly not. It's time for bed. But it can't be. It is, you know, Morris. Bedtime. Well, if Stephen says it's bedtime, then it must be. If Stephen says it's bedtime, then it must oh, be. Oh, don't be cheeky, Morris. <clears throat> Stephen, will you sing us a bedtime song? <laughs> of course I will, Doris. How about Wee Willy Winky? Oh, yes. Wee Willy Winky runs through the town Upstairs and downstairs in his nightgown Rapping at the windows, crying through the lock Are the children safe in bed? It's past eight o'clock Wee Willy Winky runs through the town Upstairs and downstairs in his nightgown Rapping at the windows, crying through the lock Are the children safe in bed? It's past eight o'clock Are the children safe in bed? It's past eight o'clock Goodbye, everybody! Goodbye! Goodbye. Be back again! Be back soon! Bye! Bye.